Mm-hmm. Okay, I think we're good to go. Yes, thank you for tuning in, everyone, to this week's online Catsock event. I hope you're enjoying the series so far. Um, there's more to come. That's all I'm going to tell you, um, and it should be exciting. I would also say, if you have, you know, it'd be nice to get some feedback, not anything to... Um, to, uh, I just want to know where everyone's enjoying it because we've had a bit of a range of talks. You know, we had the presentation I gave, and then the interview with Father Benjamin, and Dion's one on prayer, um, and then another sort of interview um, with Sister Valentina. So it'd be nice to know, you know, what's sort of working well. But um, anything will be appreciated. Okay. So today we're going to talk about Mary, which is nice, very Catholic theme. Uh, our Catholic night, and uh, and I think this will be an interesting one because Mary is often quite a confusing topic sometimes with Catholicism, and and, and uh, it, it teaches some rather confusing concepts about her. So what we're going to do in today's episode is talk about Mary and specifically her four uh, Marian dogmas. Okay, um, and so before we begin with with all of that. Maybe, Sister, you could explain uh, what is a dogma, what are the dogmas and doctrines, maybe what are the differences, that sort of thing. Mm. I was trying to to find out an example. Probably you scientists can help me more. So I went to Francesca, where she lives here with us, and I asked, she's a a biologist, and I asked, what is really fundamental in biology? So that, that thing that without that, you cannot do any biology. And we're thinking and thinking, and she said two things. So the first one is uh, water. Without water, there's not life. Therefore, there's no biology <laughs> or chemistry of anything. So the dogma uh, is uh, something like this. It's something in our faith that without them, there's not faith. It's like the, the foundation of our faith. I was saying to Toby before, it's like, uh, when we when we think and we believe that Jesus is uh, Jesus Christ is man and God, this is the very core of our faith. Without this belief, everything goes down. So in the Catholic faith, and I, I forgot to say something. So the word dogma in in Greek means basically comes from dokeo, which means to opinionate, mm-hmm. to suppose. Okay. So when you suppose something means that after this something you can start reasoning. Yes. So the dogmas were actually the basic ideas um, upon which the philosophers could build then their doctrines. Mm. So because we we actually used a lot of Greek philosophy in, in Christian theology, we adopt this word to say that you know. We also have dogmas. We also have basic concepts, which are not concepts, actually, a relationship with God, that without them, the rest falls down. Mm. And from there, the whole doctrine, the whole building of the doctrines is built. I don't know if I answered Yeah, 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 no, for sure. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like setting the, the boundaries for something to work on. It's, you know, so as you said, a bit sort of, logical problems in philosophy you have to set certain rules in order to presume make your conclusions right because other than that you could come up with all our counter arguments for it and that sort of thing so it's this fundamental and as you said with biology it's kind of core that we base our whole theology around and it's kind of i guess if you were thinking about um or if you're inquiring into the faith you probably want to go straight to the dogma because it's no use you know looking at all of the um, doctrines and all of the opinions of, of the church if you don't believe the core principles mm-hmm. and then I guess if you believe the core principles you're like okay I now am understanding what, what limits we're playing with. exactly the father of the church used to say two little um, phrase phrases fides que credito which means the faith in which believe mm-hmm. so we believe in a faith that is is it's made of uh, concepts and, and, as I said, relationship. But we also believe in the faith. We, we also believe w- with an attitude, with, with, which is the attitude of trust, 
they used to say fides qua creditor, the faith with which we believe. So I would say when we think about dogmas, we, we don't have to think that there are things we have to swallow, like the vitamins we take in the morning. No, uh, the dogmas speak about people, uh, speak about the relationship between God and the people of God, between us Christians and the love that God expressed throughout the whole history of salvation. And so we need to understand, but we also need an attitude of trust and we cannot trust if we don't know. Mm -hmm. So the dogmas actually are a door, an invitation to know more God. Yeah, I see. Okay. So this is this is this is good because now we understand what that means. We can look at the dogmas associated with Mary, okay, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know because it's core to our belief. So hopefully you know we'll be able to explain them and and, um, and convince you if you're not already convinced. <laughs> um, so one of the dogmas I'm aware of is um, this concept that Mary is mother of God. Right? Some people have issues with that because they're like, well, oh, God is the supreme person. How can God have a mother? Um, and does that mean that you know Mary is also divine in the same sense as God? And then people get confused because then you know it's like, well, are there two gods? Or are you worshiping this person? So, what do you how you know how would you explain this concept of Mary being the mother of God, but so not divine mm -hmm. in that sense? We're gonna see how the dogmas about Mary always say something both about God and about us. Mm. And the very first dogma about Mary, which is the mother of God, uh, is the first because it was the first to be promulgated in the fourth century, imagine, very long ago. And this dogma says a lot about the, the identity of Christ. If we believe, so the, the word in Greek used to, to name this dogma is Theotokos, which means the one who bear one who is God. So why do we need to uh, understand and accept this dogma? Because to, to say that is to say that Christ is both, is both human and God. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if Jesus is God and Jesus is man, Mary was mother of the man. Jesus was also God. So she was mother of the second person of the Trinity. She wasn't mother of God the Father, <laughs> but she was mother of the second person of the Trinity. Therefore, she was mother of God. We're not saying that Mary is a goddess. Somehow, we are saying that each one of us is called to be mother of God. Because the word of God today needs mothers and fathers, needs someone to open themselves to the word and make it flesh. Mm. I mean, you can read the word of God that says, love your enemies. Ah, this is very beautiful. But you become the mother of God, the, the father somehow. When you say, yes, I want this to become flesh in me. So when you have an issue with your neighbor, which is the person maybe you live with, you remember this word and you say, Lord, I want this word to become flesh in me today. Mm. And that word is born today. In your house so somehow uh, mary invites us today to be mothers of god with that saying yes to the word of god now in our context i see so it's kind of like i, I like that it's kind of like making us analogous with her in that sense that she was you know not only she birthed you know jesus but she then became like just his disciples so it's this idea of her, her um as you say, sort of inviting God in, and then, um, and then through that, he, uh, he can work his will. Exactly. Yeah, and that's also an interesting point um, about, I think, just in case anyone is um, unsure, but we spoke of Jesus being fully man and fully God, and I think this sometimes is confusing because, especially in popular culture, um, Jesus can sometimes be depicted as the son of God distinct from God the Father, whereas in uh, many Christian um, doctrines, and specifically Catholicism, there's this idea that Jesus is both fully man and fully God. He's not half and half, he's not like Hercules and all these other um, uh, mythological people, but both fully man and fully 
uh, divine. Um, I think this was a big revelation for me because yeah. of the fact you grow up and, you know, Jesus is always depicted as being, you know, son, and, you know, in the Simpsons or shows like that, you know, you see um, <laughs> them depicted. And, and I guess as a child, you sort of believe those, those things. So when you realize Jesus is, in, is God incarnate, God made flesh, then sort of is like, oh, wow, this makes sense as to why he was so powerful. Yeah. And so, so when we think of Mary being mother to that, Exactly. That makes it even more powerful. And you make me think about something else we were sharing before. It was uh, the, father, the fathers of the church to explain why. Because, I mean, the, the, the primitive church discussed a lot this. They, they, they achieved, after many, many centuries, discussion, the understanding of what meant that Jesus, was, uh, Jesus Christ was, was God and was man. There was the, in the different concilium that they decided, not because they decided, because the revelation of God uh, was given to them, the God, the Jesus was uh, God and, and, and also man. But um, the father of the church, the church used to say, whatever is not assumed cannot be saved. So how uh, does our human flesh, our human nature, can be saved if Jesus doesn't become one of us. Mm. Because he embraced our nature. He became one of us. Then from there, he raised our, our nature back to divinity. In fact, the Orthodox Church speaks about, when, when they speak about holiness, they speak about divinization. Mm. So they say how the Son of God became uh, one of us, a man, uh, human, we are called to divinization. We are called to grow to the stature of Christ, as the Ephesian, the letter to the Ephesians says. Yeah, I've heard that, this idea that um, Jesus or God became man so that we men um, can become God. like God. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And but all from, for me, uh, we, we um, Holy is played in the way we listen. So I think Mary, especially in this first um, uh, dogma, teaches us how to listen. She was able to receive God in her womb because she, she listened to the call of God through the angel. So what does it mean? I think to me that is very, very actual. I don't know if, if you I don't want to uh, advertise Netflix here, but I have to say I watched this um, like documentary about social media. Oh yeah, it's called the social dilemma. I've have you watched it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know these things, but you when you when you listen to the people who work with for these big companies saying be very careful because you've been manipulated, mm. you question what do I listen? So what do I allow to to make me fruitful or not? Because this is this is the question. This is discernment. What do I allow to enter in me and do something in me? Mm. And I think Mary teaches us how to discern what is good uh, and what can make us fruitful. And when we open ourselves to what is good, our life is fulfilled. Mm. And not just for us, it, it gives fruit of goodness around us. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think this is a, an important topic because, again, I speak from this childlike mentality. You grow up and you assume everything that people tell you is true. Um, and then when you get conflicting ideas or, or that sort of thing, it, it makes you very confused. So I think it's it's important to sort of work about, you know, make sure you're not just believing everything that's being told to you because even on mainstream media, there's that thing that's gone around about fake news and, and mm -hmm. you saw from the social dilemma how you know, the impact at which uh, minimal adjustments or, or personalizations can alter your whole, almost your way of thinking. Exactly. So I think it's important to take that into your own hands and figure out what, what is truthful. So I guess, yes, Mary is, she took God in um, as truth and, and lucky for her. Uh, yeah. I think she was right. So. And the, the key way to understand, I think, for her that she was on the right way was the strength she had to go immediately to her cousin mm. and serve. So service. Uh, so when we go out from ourselves, when we when we go from ourselves 
our individuality to, towards to the community, that is the sign that what we are discerning, what we are listening, what we are influ influenced by is something good. Yeah, there's definitely that sort of, it's a very interesting phenomenon because I think today the world can be quite self-focused. And so, yes, one way of discerning, you know, the truth is that it's so true that it makes you want to share it. Right? Yeah. And it's like, that doesn't really make sense in today's self-centered world because why would you share what you're profiting from? Right. But this is the whole, you know, you get all these things, the more you give out, the more you build up. Right? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I find that, yeah, very interesting. Um, yeah, it's sort of, you want to share it and, and you don't have the same, it's not as aggressive as some cases where, for example, um, you believe something to be true and then you want other people to believe it almost to affirm your belief. Whereas this, I don't think, has that element. And you can tell because often when people are talking to you about but they're not aggressive, they're not like, oh, you've got to believe it. You know, they're like, um, they're more, they're trying to invite you in, but they understand that, you know, it's not... Uh, always accept it won't always make sense to you mm -hmm. so i think that does speak a lot about that discernment of truth and yeah i guess mary she goes straight to the cousin yeah. so that's yeah, very interesting yeah. um okay so um the second dogma that's typically associated with mary and is a little controversial mm -hmm. between different doctrines um oh, sorry different denominations um is this idea of perpetual virginity because, I mean, it's claimed in a few cases that Mary is free from sin, and so, and, and that she never um, enters into this sort of sexual act. She's perpetually a virgin. Um, but then there are some people who argue that Jesus had brothers and sisters, and it's all about yeah. how, how this makes sense. So how, how would you explain this dogma? No, first of all, just to say, uh, these brothers and sisters, if you know that, that uh, in the Semitic culture, this is not a justification to say that you have uh, brothers and sisters, because in the Semitic culture, brother and sister is anyone who belongs to the large family. Mm. So that is not really a proof that Jews have brothers and sisters. Um, that was funny. When last year, uh, Father Jaya was here. Mm. Uh, he's Indian, but he told us that he called his um, niece daughter. And if he doesn't do that, his brother would be offended. Wow. So, you know, it's <clears throat> cultures. Uh, we are brothers and sisters. Uh, in that culture, we called each other brothers and sisters. So, um, but I think the doctrine of um, the, the dogma of, of the virginity of Mary is very deep. And unfortunately, we stay very in the surface uh, uh, discussing all these things. We, we often don't go deeper. The dogma was promulgated between the, the sixth and the seventh century again um in uh, sorry i was just saying someone is leaving um and, and i think what is important is again to wonder what that means in the perspective of god and what what that means for us humans uh, the dogma says that mary was virgin first during and after uh, giving birth, which places us really in the perspective of God. God who is the master of past, present and future and places us in the perspective of a God who really looks after our integrity. This is what this, um, first of all, this dogma means. God was so dedicated that he didn't impose anything to Mary. He asked Mary permission. Um, he, he didn't say, you have to do that, otherwise the world will be lost. He just present to her the promise of her people and, it, it, and just waited for her yes. And doing that, he, do, he did it so uh, gently that therefore he entered, he penetrated her life in a very delicate way respecting her integrity. And, and this integrity allowed Mary to open their life and to uh, offer their life fully to, to Jesus. So she became a disciple of Jesus. Jesus was chaste, 
which means he, he had a love for everyone. His life was for everyone. And Mary followed Jesus in this just chaste love, in a way that at the end of Jesus' life, Jesus entrusted his disciple to her. This is your son. This is your mother. But also I think it's interesting to reflect about the word virginity. We often associate virginity to purity, and it's true. To be virgin means to, you know, to be pure. But the origin of the word in Sanskrit means actually, uh, you know, when the, the flower blossoms in, in spring, they're full of life, full of water. That is the origin. Yeah. Uh, turgid, full of water. So who is the virgin? The virgin is the one, the one who is full of life. It's ready to life. It's ready to be open to life and it's ready to give life. So look how deep is this concept. It's not just that you are virgin because you are pure. You're virgin because you are ready to give life. So Mary was virgin because she was pure, but also because constantly she gave life to her son, to the world around her. She was constantly ready to give life constantly maintaining herself mature and open enough to receive life to God and to give life to others. And again, this is an invitation to us. What does it mean that we are virgin? I am I am a, a consecrated woman. I mean, for me to be virgin is not a deprivation of anything. It's the very opposite is to be open to the life that comes constantly to me, this God of life that constantly gives himself to me so I can give this life back mm. to my brothers and sisters. This is a virgin heart. It's not that I might always, <laughs> <laughs> but because it's, for us is a journey. Yeah. Yeah, I think this is one of those difficult uh, ones to understand because sometimes I feel like with... Um, theological truth sometimes they they only seem to make sense retrospectively when you're looking back it's sort of like so for example you having lived in this way for so long you have this great understanding for what a gift it is and then but when, when you're younger I think sometimes it's it's you're sort of confused as to you know like it doesn't seem to make sense and I think this is where there's that you know saying yes so this sort of gift so that, um, and in doing that, you will be able to understand it later on down the line. Yeah, and I think what is important, very important, is always dialogue. Uh, especially, I mean, now I, I, I feel like an old lady, but <laughs> <laughs> I do I do remember myself being young and uh, not understanding this, not understanding, I mean, my sexuality very well. And, and willing to have someone to explain to me what that means, because we figure a lot of things and we don't know what to do with them. And I think accompaniment is very important. In your age, it's very important to have people you trust enough and you can ask any question and they don't melt, <laughs> you know? You can have honest conversation uh, and, and people who can accompany to really understand. I like the origin of the word understanding, which means to stand into something mm. so you from from within you can see the horizon of what you previously wouldn't understand yeah i think yeah this sort of is similar to that idea we spoke of just a minute ago about the culture i think is also plays a huge role right? because again i think they give you um ideas and they they sort of present um, ways of living which are generally um, constructed from random places it might be from consumerism it might be from you know this, this economic gain so and, and so it's not they're not really thinking out of your best interest necessarily so I think again it, it takes you to think about hold on you know instead of just going with the flow and just you know seeing what you think you know what you feel maybe because you could have been, you know, you can be manipulated by a lot of outward sources. Mm -hmm. So I think you're right in this idea that you have to find someone who you trust. And, and typically for me, that's someone who, you know, I, I always like people to um, 
to, to think about who they look up to. Because I think to, in today's culture, people think of successful people. Right? They think of like mm -hmm. CEOs and people with lots of money who are, who are quite successful career-wise. Um, whereas to me, I think if you think about that for more than a second, you realize actually, you know, let's think, you know, someone like Mark Zuckerberg or someone that's creating Facebook. I mean, sure, he's, he's inordinately wealthy and he's, he's you know, reached a peak of, you know, his success. But I don't think I like the sound of him. He doesn't seem like a particularly nice person. And, and so to me, I think what I value is someone who has often what is associated with sort of devout Christian people, um, which is this sort of sense of calm, sense of purpose, and just the way they interact with other people and, and with themselves as well. So I think that's important if you are thinking about these sort of questions, which are difficult. I mean, something like sexuality is, you know, it's, it's the, the battle or the, you know, between if it's, if it's good, can it be controlled? Is it, mm -hmm. what is it really? Um, this is sort of plague humanity from the beginning. You know, you see it all across art and, and it, it, can, it seems to confuse people. So I think, yeah, if you are interested, you have to find some, as you say, someone you can trust who you think, okay, you, you've got it right and see what they have to say. Exactly. So dialogue honestly with oneself, which is often not easy. Uh, I think when I see Mary and I see her virgin, I see someone who was really herself. Mm. She was her true self. This is the, the gentleness of God leading us. He always leads us to our true self, which is our self in Christ. Yeah. Uh, so um, I think, and, and we we really experience that we are in that journey when we are in that journey. We we know that. Exactly. Yeah. I think this is this is an interesting point as well. Just a little tangent, but mm -hmm. um, about your your true self through through Christ. Um, we've got more on that in our retreat. Just a uh -huh. um, <laughs> in a, in a week or two. Uh, so so watch out for that. But this idea that. I think again it's something that seems quite counterintuitive because it's like how do I sort of center my life around God or how do I sort of humble myself completely to him um, and also maintain this idea of my own identity yeah. but often it's, as you say it's it's through this process that you find your your true self and you reach your sort of God-given potential. So. And I think that happens when you when you realize that God is the first one humbling himself before you. There is this beautiful uh, hymn of uh, one of the St. Paul letters that says this, he who was God, he humbled himself to become one of us. Yeah. And so he humbles himself to become one of us. He respects us, he respected Mary to the point to ask permission. Yeah. So this is why we are called it's, it's like the, the, the language of love. If someone kisses you, you want to kiss back. You know, if someone serves you, you want to serve back. Jesus puts himself at your feet and you want to do it back. Yeah. It's about experiencing this God through the community that also leads us to do the same. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, two things um, there. I think, yeah, one, I think there should be more um, emphasis on this idea that he invited, or uh, yes, he invited Mary, and it was it was up to Mary. He was waiting for that yes, because typically, um, again, in, in sort of more mythological situations, when when the gods would interact with humans, it would often be quite an aggressive, <laughs> yes. kind of you know, verging on or probably rape kind of yeah. scene where they with, yeah. with these people, and um, and then they'd create these sort of half men, half human kind of characters. So it's it's all out of something quite you know diabolical. Exactly. Whereas, um, whereas, so I think that gives, and this was all across, if you look at it in, in all sorts of mythology, this is typically the pattern that forms. And so when you look at um, when God invited Mary into this um, situation, uh, it, it's a bit more profound because you're like, wow, why is this, you know, an all powerful? Why did he humble himself? Yeah. So that's, um, yeah, I find that quite interesting. I can't remember what else I was going to say. But, uh... <laughs> no, I was, I was thinking that probably Mary, in her virginity, invites us to a kind of ecology of virginity, you know, um, in the sense that she invites us to respect the environment we live in, the 
people we live with, ourselves, our body. How often I realize I don't respect my body because I don't respect its limits. Mm. I get angry at myself because I feel tired, <laughs> you know. Um, respecting God. So is uh, this word shalom uh, that Jesus says when after his resurrection is the peace that touches all the level of humanity, all the levels. Uh, this is the respect that comes from an experience of true virginity. So because I feel that God respects me, I live in I live my body as a temple, but also see your body as a temple, see the nature around me as a temple. So how do I want to respect mm. the nature that God gave us, you know, which in Sika what Francis wrote beautiful, allowed us to see very actual. Mm. Yes, and, and and again I think this sort of um talks more about this connection between the body and the soul, right? Because in, in not all religions do we have this idea that they're intertwined. You know, in some religions they think when you die, for example, you, you, your soul will ascend and your body will just remain mm -hmm. on the ground. Whereas um, as Catholics, we, we hold on to this idea that the body and soul will always be intertwined. Um, I guess you could think about sort of God becoming flesh in this kind of way. It's like fulfillment of that. Um, but, uh, and so when we speak of virginity, it's like, well, this this makes sense, you know, in respecting your body. It's kind of like, you know, if you want your soul to be healthy, you know, it's, it's intertwined with your body. So mm -hmm. you have to, again, treat that with respect in order to feel the benefits in your soul. Kind of yeah, so maybe a little task for each one of us for this week and the future. Uh, how do we look after our body? How do we look after our environment and the body of our brothers and sisters? This is not just subject to chastity. This no, could be it's... this could be also just exercise, you exactly. know, going to the gym, eating healthily, that sort of thing. Exactly. Um, exactly. So yeah. so yeah, keep it keep it in mind. You know, it mm -hmm. might be something uh, that doesn't you know, you might not think would have that impact. You might be like, Oh no, I'll just you know, make sure my prayer life's very good and, and we're not we're saying you should keep that, but yeah. but also maybe work on uh, increasing your physical well being and be that exercise or chastity or whatever is respect be mindful with the uh, recycling being for example yeah. <laughs> environment <laughs> yeah. um, okay great so the next dogma um i think which is uh this idea of the immaculate conception um and so yeah i think this one it's kind of confusing Maybe you could just explain what you, what you make of that, because I guess it's the issue of, well, how did God interact with Mary and, and how did Jesus come about? How is this? It just is kind of off the back of that perpetual virginity idea. So what do you, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I think so. often people actually uh, confuse, the confuse the two and they think that Immaculate Conception is the virginity of Mary, mm. but Immaculate Conception means that Mary was in. Uh, conceived without original sin. So obviously, to understand this dogma, so the first two dogma we've been spoke, speaking about, they were actually promulgated very early in the church. We said fifth, sixth, seventh century. Mm -hmm. uh, the church is formulating, fixing in a good way uh, their foundation. foundation yeah. uh, these two late dogmas actually were promulgated in the 19th and 20th century. Uh, the Immaculate Conception in, I think, uh, uh, 1850 something, mm. and um, the last one, the Assumption in 1950, so 1854, I think. So uh, some, somehow uh, they are late, but that doesn't mean that the church didn't hold the tradition about the Immaculate Conception mm. as the assumption for the whole centuries, you know. Yeah. Uh, so to understand this particular one, we need to understand then what original sin is. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I like very much um, a definition that uh, Pope Benedict, Emeritus Pope Benedict, when he wasn't a Pope, he was still uh, Ratzinger, Cardinal Ratzinger, gave 
um, in, in, a, in an interview called Gott and Dir. It's not that I know German. I just Googled the. Uh, it means yeah. God and the world. Very interesting. And he, he speaks about uh, original sin as a distortion in relationship. I like very much this because if sin, amartia in, in, in Greek, means when you, when you miss the, the, miss the mark. The mark yeah. So the original sin is the first missing of the mark, yeah. which means the first is the very radical twisting in relationship with ourself, with God, mm -hmm. with, uh, with the others. And the doctrine of original sin uh, tells us that basically we, we, we take this from our ancestor. We, we are born with this. So we are born with a tendency of twisting our, our way we, we listen to God, our way we relate to, to him, to the others. To, instead of being open, we, we grow inward. So what do, what do we say when we say that uh, Mary was born without original sin? We say that basically God prepared her to accomplish the mission that she, she had to be the mother of Jesus. Therefore, that means that she was conceived without this twisting, this uh, uh, inherit, inherited this twisting. This to sin. Exactly. Um, but again, in the, in the history of the church, uh, there was a lot of dialogue between people who, who would say that Mary was just like one of us, and that she was like one of us, but she had original sin and everything, and an, another group of people would say, no, she, she had something special, and in the end, this last um, option won until the promulgation of the uh, dogma in 1854 by Pius uh, the Ninth. Mm. And um, what I think is very interesting is the context in which this dogma was promulgated. So we are in the, in the, in the 19th century. So, you know, in that uh, time, first the Illuminists, then the positivists mm. in Europe, basically they had this uh, understanding of, a uh, very positive understanding of uh, human nature. Basically, they will say, this is a very big simplification, but just to make, to make things understandable. They will say, if you put uh, humans in a, in a good context, in a good social context, in a good social structure, we'll be in paradise. Mm. So basically, they, uh, they, they, they saw that uh, human beings were perf perfect, themselves. When the, when the church promulgated this um, dogma, it's not just collecting a tradition from the century of the, of the church, but it's also saying we cannot make it without God. I mean, um, society is important, but ideologies are not the answer to our world. Yes. We, we, are, we are not able to save ourselves. And so that, that was the answer of the Catholic Church so to that specific context. Yeah, I think yeah, there's a lot of stuff being said there, which um, I, I just want to comment on briefly. I think that, yeah, I think to begin thinking about Mary with no sense of original sin is to first understand what original sin is. Because, mm -hmm. again, it's something that a lot of people have issues with because they, they're like, why am I, you know, tarnished, you know, from birth? Why am I carrying the sins of my ancestors? I haven't done anything. But it's this, I think you have to think of it, instead of taking that sin, or like, it's not like, oh, you, you know, you did that. It's more this, it's that sense you're born with where it's that tendency to sin anyway. So it's like your first sin is just the fact that you're, you're, you're drawn to it. So I think it can all be, uh, I think, helped with a greater understanding of what original sin is. Um, and you can read other sort of definitions because it is again a confusing topic and so sometimes it's it's helpful to see other definitions. I know C.S. Lewis has an interesting one but I can't, I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, but no, and, and again I guess so if we think of Mary being uh, 
free from that. So for God, as you said, prepared her. I think that that's very interesting because it shows um, sort of the vital role, you know, parents and, you know, more specifically a mother has, you know, if you, if you think about God and, um, and, and Jesus's incarnation, it's like he, ha he, he had to prepare Mary because if Jesus had just been born of a, of a woman who, you know, was quite sinful, <laughs> and it's like, well, what would have happened? <laughs> you know, because, you know, at those early ages of, of you know, infancy, we've already spoken many times today about how subject children can be um, to, to surroundings. So it was, it was vital that Mary was uh, immaculate in this way, free of sin, because she would have had so much influence as to Jesus exactly. and his upbringing and, so it, I think that makes a lot of sense, really. And Ratzinger, uh, Pope, Pope Benedict, um, in, that, in that interview, uh, he said something very beautiful. He said, we don't, we don't have to think that um, that was a, a privilege for Mary. That is a hope for us. Mm. And it's, I understand this like this. When you throw a stone in a lake, um, so the stone goes down and lots of waves are creating on the surface of the water and they can reach very far, far places from the center is what grace does in our life as Mary she was born in grace um, but it's like that the grace of her vocation reached the root of her life her ancestors and this is what God calls and God grace does in us. It's like a stone thrown in, in the lake of our life that can reach our roots. I'll give you a very uh, clear example. The other day someone calls me and say, ah, Vale, thank you so much because of the journey I'm doing, spiritual accompaniment, uh, praying and understanding better myself. Uh, my mom is starting to do the same journey, looking at me, she she felt questioned and so she started to do this this is grace and this is the power of grace that reaches it in a specific moment in our life but if we allow the grace to penetrate that reaches our roots so this is a hope for every everyone and also we don't have to forget that before original sin is original grace mm. before uh, you know the fall it was creation, and that, and then Jesus, you know, and the Holy Spirit that constantly accompanies us in this journey. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, I think that the idea of sort of accepting the grace first and foremost is is powerful because it, it's necessary. I think a lot of people think, well, you know, my work. So if I go and do this task, that will be me sort of respecting God and it might be but I think at first of all you have to make sure that you're centered in your own and you've accepted the grace because um if you're doing all of these works or whatever but you're you're not centered yourself then you know people aren't going to be have that attraction or that, or that curiosity that beguilement when they look at you it's like why are they so happy and <laughs> you know why are they so you know all of these things which often make you question as mm -hmm. you said um and so i i think it, it's all the more important and that's first and foremost because only then will it have that rippling effect as you as you've outlined there um and then when you speak of mary as hope i think that's a that's a good way of thinking of her because um obviously i think sometimes people they look to jesus obviously as, as moral perfection it's like, well, you know, what would Jesus do? Often people think of that. And uh, and for the most part, I'd say that's that's great. You know, there's a lot to be learned there. But I think sometimes it can, I, I've known some people who think that that weight is quite, <laughs> to live like Christ, they're like, how am I ever supposed to, you know, live up to that? And although that, that is something to be strived for, I think there's something to be said that Mary is, is, a, is a good example of, I, I've heard of her as, as like the perfect human because she she is fully human but she is sort of the fulfillment of what humanity can be if you accept god at that core level mm -hmm. um and she has to be again i think if you look at 
this concept of Jesus being the new Adam, Mary being the new Eve, she would have to be perfect in, in her nature, um, immaculate, free from sin, because then, I mean, what are you saying about Adam and Eve, you know, because, you know, Eve can't be lesser, you know, they've got to both be. Mm -hmm. Although I have to say, I think, and look at uh, John 2, when Mary actually prompt Jesus to do his first sign at Cana yes. in Galilee. They have quite a discussion there, for nearly a quarrel there. They have nearly an argument. Uh, but I mean, I'm joking now, but I think that we need to be careful to distinguish perfection from emotionless. Because so, we, we have this tendency to think that to be perfect means not to feel emotions. Mm. These are Greek, actually. Um, concept. I mean, it's a, a stoicism kind yes, of yeah. perspective. It's not Christian. <laughs> we are not stoic. We are Christians, so we are allowed to feel emotions. We are we are allowed to feel angry. We are allowed to feel uh, different desires. The question is what we do with them, how we deal with them, how we grow with them, how we acknowledge them, how we name them and grow uh, in this journey. Because even we're talking about holiness and holy people these days but I mean each of them were very different and they express holiness within human limits so to be perfect doesn't mean to be without emotions or to be like floating in the air mm. it means to be very down to earth yeah and sometimes it means Ex expressing this emotion exactly because you know, sometimes that's what it needs mm -hmm. i think this is a, an interesting point because actually stoicism has, has a bit has had a bit of a resurgence in recent years uh -huh. um yeah. as well as i guess you know often when um people seek spirituality sometimes they often look to this you know like buddhist monks and, and sort of eastern monks um which tend to have this kind of removed attitude it's very sort of like they recognize the emotion and they don't let it affect them. And I've always thought this is an interesting difference between that and Christianity. It's that we don't neglect the emotions in the same way. We sort of, we, we have them and we, we share them and we use it to, you know, for whatever we want to show. So yeah, I think that's, that's, a, that's a good point. I didn't know about the, the Greek thinking perfection and emotionlessness <laughs> um but yeah i think that's also good because I, i think sometimes when you read the gospels it's very sort of to the letter sometimes you don't get all the emotions that play into it because it's hard to tell based on the translation mm -hmm. and all of that sort of thing so it's important to remember that they did have emotions and they had these sort of well i have a friend who did a dissertation on a greek verb which described the way Jesus often felt before people, which means literally a movement in the intestine. Oh. When you attach, you know, here, and, and in the gospel, I can't remember which gospel, in, but uh, this verb is very specific and means just this, mm -hmm. the way Jesus felt uh, very, very touched by the suffering of people. Uh, so the gospel does, but you are right. Sometimes we we don't know the Greek often, so yes, we, yeah. we don't we cannot appreciate. It's hard the to depth. imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see. So how can we use this in our lives? Do you think this idea? Of... Well, uh, totally. Uh, as I as I say, I think um, I feel that I need to rediscover again uh, the grace has a lot of power in me in my life. Especially when I uh, once again uh, discover my limits, I need to discover again that God's has more power than my limits. Yes, that's a good point. Yeah. Yes, that's a take, but yeah, I think so. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, our last dogma is the is to do with Mary's assumption. So exactly. I, from my understanding, which is not it's not deep necessarily, <laughs> but it's this idea that Mary didn't um, just die, she was assumed into heaven yeah. um, some days, I can't remember when it is, but they, we celebrate each year, don't we? So, the yeah, 15th of August. 15th of August, there you go. So yeah, would you, could you tell me a bit more about that? So uh, and again, as I told you, this is a quite late uh, dogma, it was promulgated in just 
70 years ago, on the 1st of November, 1950. And, uh, but it was, this was uh, something that the, the Christians believed since the beginning. And you can see it in art, mm -hmm. artists, uh, this la our lady, this one, this face actually, if you can see, is an is a statue of an assumption, mm -hmm. but it's quite recent. But you can see work of art from different centuries that portrays Mary being assumed into heaven, or um, the Orthodox equivalent would be the Domitian. So the Orthodox believe that Mary, because the assumption is that Mary died. Or maybe she doesn't didn't die. She was as, assumed in heaven. We, it doesn't say very much. But the Greek believes that May, Mary uh, went to sleep, and mm. then she passed on to Jesus. You know, she went straight to heaven. And there are many uh, paintings portraying uh, Mary. One of them I like very much is a Caravaggio one. Caravaggio mm. one. Beautiful, beautiful. Is it the blue and red? No, no, no. No, it's very red, very dark. And Mary is portrayed as a woman who is still pregnant. It's beautiful, the symbology is beautiful, because what he's saying, Caravaggio is saying, Mary was pregnant her whole life. And she even went to heaven pregnant. So her uh, uh, state of uh, life was, to, was, again, to be open to God's life in her. Uh, but essentially, what would this, this uh, uh, dogma tell us? Uh, basically, it's a is a, a scream of optimism. Actually, not optimism. I don't know if, if I like this word, mm. but a Christian realism. Sure. In a time after two world wars, in which uh, Europe was uh, basically uh, navigating in very, I mean, somehow dark waters. There was a lot of negativism uh, in in the way people. Was feel and think, then we had a lot of good things afterwards, but it was a tough time straight after the wars. So what did the Pope, when he promulgated this um, dogma, said? First of all, collecting and gathering the tradition of centuries. He said that Mary is, is the first Eve, the first human to be a reason with her son, which is beautiful. Mm. But also the Pope and the church wants to say the wars, the negative things don't have the last word. Death doesn't have the last word. Actually, life has the last word. And we see in Mary, in her resurrection, because the assumption is Mary's resurrection, we see in her our future. There is this uh, worship song, song that, that sings like, uh, we belong to the day. I, I often repeat this to myself. Um, we belong to that day. We belong to the fullness uh, of Christ. And she, being the mother, I think she has the right <laughs> to be the first, to be the first to live this fullness. Yeah. So again, hope. Yeah, yeah, it's beautiful. Um, I especially like that. Uh, as you said, the dawn mission or something, which I guess yes has the, the that sense of sleep. I I, I like thinking about that because it's it's this idea that you know typically when you go to sleep you're you're expecting that you wake up the next day. Right? So I, I like this concept that Mary, when she was assumed, she had that confidence in her that when she went to sleep she'd wake up. You know, and and so it's true when she assumed into heaven. So that's nice. Um, and again, as Father Benjamin said a few weeks ago, heaven is not physical space, it's a dimension of being. Yes. So we don't know how that happened, but we believe that uh, Mary's reason with Jesus. Wow, wonderful. Wonderful. I think, I think we're, it's we've... Eight. It's eight o'clock <laughs> on the dot. It's random. But do you have a favorite of the Marian dogmas? <laughs> do you? Do I? Oh, I think maybe, I think my, I mean, the mother of God, I think is the one for me, just because there's so much to be said about Mary's role in, in, in sort of giving birth to God. It's like, to me, it doesn't often make sense. It's like, that's huge, I think. Um, 
and just the significance of the mother as well. And I think that's beautiful as well because unfortunately in today's world, I feel like it's so plagued with this idea of you know patriarchy and, and, and things. And so when I see something which celebrates this sense of womanhood, of motherhood, it's just, I think it sort of helps me to believe more in, in Catholicism as the sort of truth of life, I guess. Yes, there was um, October is uh, the month of Our Lady of the Rosary. And I, as you know, I lived in Brazil. And the, there, is a, there is lots of story about how Our Lady of the Rosary arrived there. But there is a, a story according to which Our Lady arrived in a boat from Portugal. And, and the, the Lord of the land wanted to take her in a, in a, a little chapel. Mm. But the statue would in the morning would appear in the beach. And that happened several times until one day in which Our Lady said, I want the black people that were slaves there to take me to that place. And so the black people went, the slave took Our Lady to, to that place and she stayed with, she, she just decided to stay with them. Just to say what you say, to confirm what you say that our lady is the mother of everyone mm. and especially is the mother of the little ones yeah. <laughs> she's the one who loves the the ones who no one loves mm. yeah yeah that's very true and uh, and speaking of that that's that story i think uh, there's a lot of um, marian miracles you know think of lady of guadalupe and, uh, and lady of lords you know and they're very interesting so i'd encourage you all to to read into those and uh, and especially their impact um, because often when we think of miracles you know you can listen to the story and you can be like okay okay that sounds you know makes sense to me but i think often it's the impact of the miracles which tell you more about their authenticity so for example lady of guadalupe you listen to the story and then afterwards i think it was within like a hundred years the whole of, of mexico who, which was uh, initially aztec all converted to Christianity, so it's like that's an inordinate amount of people that just converted, and it's like all but typically, you know, surrounding that one miracle. Um, and then you look at the Lady of Lords as well, the impact it has, it's still a huge um, site to visit, isn't it? And people bring, um, there's, there's constant miracles being noted down from people bathing in the water and things. So I'd encourage you to read further on those. Wonderful. You okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.